Elmore Leonard has been described as the greatest crime writer of our time, perhaps ever. Leonard's career as a writer spans over half a century, beginning in 1949 with the publication of his first story, Trail of the Apache, in Argosy magazine. His work in the Western genre culminated in the publication of Ombre in 1961, which was voted as one of the best Westerns of all time and reincarnated as a classic film starring Paul Newman. As the market for Western fiction dried up, Leonard wrote scripts for industrial and educational films until a series of newspaper pieces about the life of a Detroit police officer led him to the genre of crime fiction. The publication of The Big Bounce in 1969 marked the beginning of a 30-plus year novel spree in the genre of crime writing which resulted in a string of crime classics, 52 Pickup, The Switch, Stick, La Brava. With the publication of Glitz in 1985, Leonard made it to the bestseller list and has remained a best-selling writer since then with such high-octane crime thrillers as Bandits, Freaky Deaky, Rum Punch, Get Shorty, and Out of Sight, the last few of which have been adapted into critically acclaimed films. Elmer Leonard visited with the Writers Institute in Albany. My breakthrough was Glitz, and that sold about 200000 because there was so much being written about me at that time, first time in the, uh, on the New York Times list. And, uh, and the, the hook, as far as the, the journalist was concerned, uh, overnight success after 30 odd years, you know. And they all pictured me writing in some basement or something. And, not, you know, not, and a, a re <laughs> an interviewer says, uh, do you resent success coming at your age, because I was in my 60s by then, see? And I resented the question, <laughs> and I said, I said, what do you mean? I said, I've always been successful. I sell everything I write, and a lot of it is sold to Hollywood, and I've always made money. What's success, getting on the Times list? I get letters that are, uh, some of them are quite strange. And for example, this is one, right, right, see I'm all out of, uh, here, here's one from the Lone Doctor Publishing Company. Dear Elmore, I ain't got a clue who you are, but I think you might be a black musician or something. <laughs> e escape, Elmore, adieu to you, the doc. Or, I have been a fan of yours for many years. Over these years, I have had the good fortune to find different pictures of you uh, to start a small collection. I think you are one of the most beautiful women I have ever seen in my life. Your beauty and talent is rated right up top in my book. Should you not be able to fill my request, I will understand fully. You will still be one of my favorite dream ladies for as long as I live. God bless you and good health and so on. <clears throat> I haven't sent him a picture yet because I don't want to disappoint him. Here's, a, here's one from a 12 and a half year old girl who said, uh, I know you've overcome many personal problems that I won't mention. Congratulations. I would love to write books like yours one day, but I know you're supposed to write about what you know, and frankly, I'd be afraid to hang around all the sleazeballs, lowlifes, <laughs> psychos and con men you've obviously spent so much time with <laughs> to be able to write about them so well. I'll probably be forced to write, um, to forced to write about refined and intelligent people like myself. <laughs> um, is she putting me on? I don't know. 
I uh, audition characters in early scenes, and they have to be able to talk because because the reader will not be satisfied with my prose if I wrote in the classic sense of of, uh, of a novelist, the omniscient author, and using my language. It, it would be mediocre at best. So, which is, which is what Hemingway said he discovered, that he couldn't write in the normal way, and this is the style then that resulted from him, because he didn't have the talent to write novels that way, you know? So, uh, and I think over about 10 years it, as, well, from the time I started, although I was always, um, the, the writers who used dialogue, Hemingway, of course, uh, were the ones who got me going, and I studied more closely because most, mo almost all the books that I was reading in high school, Book of the Month Club, uh, current selections, I, all of them I thought uh, there were just too many words in them. They were unnecessary words. And so <clears throat> I, just, I developed this style and so that my characters have to be able to talk in an interesting way. We were asked to describe how we see ourselves as the writer. And this is what I wrote. What he does, he makes us do all the work, the people in the books. Puts us in scenes and says, go ahead and do something. No, first he thinks up names. Takes forever to think up names like Bob and Jack. Jackie for a woman, a female lead, or Frank. Years ago, anyone named Frank in one of his books was a bad guy. So then he used Frank as the name of a good guy one time, and this Frank wouldn't talk. Refused to come out and become the kind of person Elmore wanted, so he changed his name to Jack after thinking of names for another few weeks, and it felt so good he couldn't shut the guy up. I mean this Jack, not Elmore. So he names us and he says, okay, start talking. And that's what we do. Sometimes if a character has trouble expressing himself, he's demoted, is given less to do in the book, or he might get shot. <laughs> What can also happen if a minor or even a no-name character shows he can talk, he can shove his way into the story and get a more important part. So Elmore names us, gets us talking to each other, bumping heads or getting along okay, and then I don't know what happens to him. I think he takes off, leaves it up to us. There was a piece written about him one time in the Village Voice called The Author Vanishes, and it's true. They all begin as stock characters in my mind. And then as I flesh them out and get to know them, then they all become, <clears throat> to me, very sympathetic characters because I have a, a, an affection for all of them, despite what they do. You know, I can understand them and I feel sorry for them. I usually feel sorry for them because they're so dumb. <laughs> and they're, <laughs> they're, into, they're just trying to make some money, hell, you know, a hustle, whatever. It might be because the, what's at stake is never that important. At least this, the the uh, dollar amount is never that much, or it doesn't have to be that much. It might be a million bucks, but that's just the that's the MacGuffin, you know. Well, Barry Sonnenfeld did get shorty, and uh, two years before the first time I spoke to Barry, I said, "I hope you don't when when someone delivers a line. I hope you don't cut to another actor." to get his reaction if it's a funny line and then you see the actor wink or grin or, or uh, uh, to let the audience know that that was a funny line. I said, because these people are serious. They're, they don't, they're not trying to be funny. And I gave him an example of a, of a script that of, uh, Bruce Willis had optioned one of mine. He gave it to a screenwriter and the screenwriter, and he sent me this, the, the uh, script and I said, and then I, I talked to Bruce about it, and I said, look, this is, this is what's wrong with the script. This, here's a character, two characters are talking, and one says to the other, do you realize that every 16 seconds in the United States, a woman is physically abused? And the other guy shakes his head and he says, you wouldn't think that many get out of line. <laughs> now, in the script, he grins and winks. I said, he doesn't grin and wink. This is, this is the man's mentality. This is, he's being serious, see? I was selling all of my work, all of my books were selling to Hollywood because they all looked like movies. They were written in scenes, 
and, move, and, and the story moved with dialogue. So the producers, the studio executives would read the book, they say, this is a movie. But when you took, when you, by the time you'd taken the 350 to 400 page manuscript down to 120 pages, the shooting script, most of the good stuff was gone. Because the, the good stuff was not in the plot. <clears throat> this plot to me just sort of uh, comes along. I'm not that interested in plot. I'm interested in how the, how the uh, characters uh, interact, how they get on each other's nerves or shoot one another or whatever they have to do. But plot, I, I think the worst thing I could possibly do is start with a plot and then try and uh, make something of it. When I adapt <clears throat> one of my books, I just assume that they like the book and they want to see the book as a movie. So I just adapt the book. May make some changes here and there, so it'll work, of course. But, <clears throat> but uh, the trouble is your enthusiasm goes into the book and your energy. And now you've got the screenplay to write. And in the first draft, maybe you, you've been, you're able to muster some more enthusiasm and you like the idea of seeing the picture. Uh, but then there's draft after draft after draft required as, as each person puts in uh, his two cents, uh, changing dialogue, changing scenes, changing, changing the story. So I, I didn't have much fun in doing that. Chris Mankowski's last day on the job, two in the afternoon, two hours to go, he got a call to dispose of a bomb. What happened, a guy by the name of Booker, a 25-year-old super dude, twice convicted felon, was in his jacuzzi when the phone rang. He yelled for his bodyguard, Juicy Mouth, to take it. Hey, Juicy, his bodyguard, his driver, and his house man were around somewhere. Will somebody get the phone? The phone kept ringing. The phone must have rung 15 times before Booker got out of the jacuzzi, put on his green satin robe that matched the emerald pin to his left ear earlobe, and picked up the phone. Booker said, who's this? A woman's voice said, you sitting down? The phone was on a table next to a green leather wingback chair. Booker loved green. He said, baby, is that you? It sounded like his woman, Moselle. Her voice said, are you sitting down? You have to be sitting down for when I tell you something. Booker said, baby, you sound different. What's wrong? He sat down in the green leather chair, frowning, working his butt around to get comfortable. The woman's voice said, are you sitting down? Booker said, I am. I have sat the fuck down. Now, you're going to talk to me what? Moselle's voice said, I'm supposed to tell you that when you get up, honey, what's left of your ass is going to go clear through the ceiling. When Chris got there, a uniform let him in. There were 13th precinct cars and a tactical station wagon parked in front. The uniform told Chris that Booker had called 9-11. They radioed him here, and when he saw who it was, he called narcotics, and they jumped at it, a chance to go through the man's house wide open with their dog. The guy from narcotics, who looked like a young vagrant, told Chris that Booker was a success story had come up through the street dealing organizations, Young Boys Incorporated and Pony Down, and was now on about the third level from the top. Look around, guy 25 years old in a home on Boston Boulevard, a mansion originally owned by one of Detroit's automotive pioneers. The guy from narcotics didn't remember which one. Look how Booker had fucked up the house, painted all that fine old oak paneling puke green. He asked Chris how come he was alone. Chris said most of the squad was out on a run, picking up illegal fireworks, but, that, but there was another guy coming. And Chris said, you know what today is? And waited for the guy from narcotics to say, no what? It's my last day on the bomb squad. Next week I get transferred out. He waited again. The guy from narcotics said, yeah, is that right? He didn't get it. It's the last time I'll ever have to handle a bomb. That's what we have, and hope to Christ I don't make a mistake. The guy still didn't get it. He said, well, that's what Booker says it is. He gets up, it blows up. What kind of bomb is that? I won't know till I look, Chris said. Booker says it's the fucking Italians. The guy from Narcotics said, trying to tell him something. 
It makes sense, otherwise why not shoot him? Like we know Booker's done, guys, we find out at Metro in long-term parking. Guys in the trunk of his car, two in the back of the head. Booker's a bad fucking dude, man. If there was such a thing as justice in the world, we'd leave his ass sitting there, let him work it out. Chris said, get your people out of the house. The chapters are usually, uh, I don't know, 10 to 20 pages, most of them around 15 pages, and there may be two or three scenes in the chapter, or there could be two anyway. Um, and the idea is to just keep the scenes, the what's going on, up, so that you are always expecting something, you know, like a cliffhanger, and uh, maybe you're, you're, you're ending scenes, not w with questions, but certainly with a question in the, in the reader's mind. Uh, and I, I, it's the pace. The, the pace is, is, is e extremely important, and the rhythm, the rhythm of the writing is extremely important to me. He goes in, and Booker says, I've been waiting. You know how long I've been waiting on you? I don't know what, where anybody's at. I've been calling. You see Juicy Mouth? Who's Juicy Mouth? Supposed to be guarding my body, man. I gotta go to the toilet. Chris walked up to him, looking at the base of the chair. Tell me uh, what the woman said on the phone. Was the bitch supposed to be in love with me? What'd she tell you? She said, I get up, I'm blown up. That's all? Is that all? Man, that's final. That's all there is, all, nothing else. Chris said, yeah, but do you believe it? Asshole, you expect me to stand up and find out? Chris was wearing a beige tweed sport coat, an old one with sagging pockets. He brought a mini mag flashlight out of the left side pocket, went down flat on the floor, and played the light beam into the four inch clearance beneath the chair. Space was empty. He came to his knees, placed the mini mag on the floor, brought a stainless Spyderco lock back pocket knife from the right side pocket, and flicked open the short blade with one hand in a quick practice motion. Booker said, hey, push him back in the chair. Cover yourself, Chris said. I don't want to cut anything off by mistake. <laughs> Man, be careful there, Booker said. Uh, so he feels around under there, under the chair, uh, and he says, hmm. And Booker said, what do you mean, hmm? Don't give me no hmm shit. What is it? What's in there? And uh, Chris looked up at Booker, and he said, 10 sticks of dynamite. Booker was clutching the chair's arms again his body upright, stiff, telling Chris, get that shit out from under me, man. Get it out, get it out of there. Chris said, somebody doesn't like you, Booker. Two sticks would have been plenty. <laughs> he says, see, most of the foam padding's been taken out. There's something in there that looks like an inflatable rubber cushion, fairly flat, laying on top of the dynamite. So pull the shit out, man. You see it, pull it out. Yeah, but what I don't see is what makes it explode. It must be in the back part where the cushion zips open. Then open the motherfucker. I can't, you're sitting on it, it's probably a two-way pressure switch of some kind. I can't tell for sure, but that'd be my guess. Booker said, you guess? You tell me you don't know what you're doing? We get all kinds, Chris said. I have to see it before I know what it is, or whether or not I can disarm it, you understand? Wait a minute now, you're saying if you can take it apart. Um, they go on like that until uh, another bomb squad guy, Jerry Baker, arrives. And he looks around and uh, uh, they enter the room. Jerry gazing up at the green and white tenting. Uh, and Booker said, finally, do uh, you decide that you're going to do something? Chris and Jerry took time to look at each other. They didn't say anything. Jerry got down to inspect the sliced open seat cushion between Booker's muscular legs and said, hmm. Booker said, another one goes, hmm. I'm sitting here on high explosives. The motherfucker goes, hmm. <laughs> Jerry stood up looking at Chris again. Well, he's cool. That's a good thing. Chris said, yeah, he's cool. As Jerry walked around to the back of the green leather chair, Booker sitting upright raised his head. Hey, I gotta go to the toilet, man, bad. Jerry reached over the backrest to put his hand on Booker's shoulder. You better wait. I don't think you can make it. I like to sit down in the morning and, and start to write. I know what the scene is, but I have to decide from whose point of view the scene is, is told, is seen, 
and the purpose of the scene, of course, to move, to move the story along, and then just see what happens. Um, and it gives me great pleasure. It's the most satisfying thing I can think of doing, just to sit there and make up a story and, and get paid for it. It's wonderful. And uh, I'm glad that at my age, uh, I'm going to be 75 this year, that I still have the energy and the, and the desire. I hope I can write several more. I'm even hoping that I might start with a good idea sometime <laughs> and then add my characters. Jerry moved from behind the chair to the French doors. We better talk about it some more. Booker's head turned to follow Chris. What are you going to, you, where are you going? Hey, motherfucker, I'm talking to you. Chris stepped out and closed the door. He moved with uh, Jerry to the far edge of the slate patio before looking back at the French doors in the afternoon sunlight. They could hear Booker in there faintly. They crossed the yard, Jerry offering Chris a cigarette. He took one and Jerry gave him a light once they reached the driveway when we're standing by the three-car garage alone in the backyard. Jerry looked up at the elm trees. He said, well, they're finally starting to bud. I thought winter was going to run through May. Chris said, that's my favorite kind of house, sort of an English tutor, before Booker got hold of it. Jerry said, why don't you and Phyllis buy one? She likes apartments, goes with her career image. She must be jumping up and down, finally got her way. Chris didn't say anything. I'm talking about you leaving the squad. I know what you meant. I haven't told her yet. I'm waiting until I get reassigned. Maybe homicide, huh? I wouldn't mind it. Yeah, but would Phyllis? Chris didn't answer. They smoked their cigarettes and could hear fire equipment arriving. Jerry said, hey, I was kidding. Don't be so serious. I know what you're saying, Chris said. Phyllis is the kind of person that speaks out. Something bothers her, she tells you about it. I know, Jerry said. There's nothing wrong with that, is there? I'm not saying anything against her. What it is, Phyllis says things even some guys would like to, but don't have the nerve. Yeah, because she's a woman, Jerry said. She doesn't have to worry about getting hit in the mouth. Chris uh, shook his head. I don't mean putting anybody down or being insulting. Look, we're at a restaurant, one of those trendy places the waiter introduces himself. This Twinkie comes up to the table. He goes, hi, I'm Wally. I'm going to be your wait person this evening. Can I get you a cocktail? Phyllis goes, Wally. When we're finished dinner, you're going to take us out and introduce us to the dishwasher? She goes, we really don't care what your name is as long as you're here when we want something. <laughs> Jerry grinned, adjusting his Tigers baseball cap. That's good. I can appreciate that. Those guys kill me. They drew on their cigarettes. Chris looked at his about to say something, working the butt between his thumb and second finger to flick it away and the French doors and some of the windows on this side of the house exploded out in a yellow, in a billow of gray smoke and tin, tinged yellow. They stood looking at the shattered doorway, at the smoke and dust thinning, settling over glass and wood fragments, shreds of black and green and white debris on the patio, silence ringing in their ears now. After a few moments, they started down the driveway, let the people waiting in front know they were okay. Chris said, yeah, the twink comes up to the table and says, he's going to be our wait person. But you have to understand, Phyllis wasn't trying to be funny. She was serious. That's the way she is. Reading, reading, reading. Because when I wasn't writing between the fifth grade and college, I was reading. I was reading everything, you know, and deciding who I liked and who I felt some kinship with as far as attitude. Because your style comes out of your attitude, how you see things, how you, you know, what your sound is. Are you funny? Are you really serious? You have a facility with, uh, for language? Can you tell your story in your words and, and, and uh, the reader's gonna say, wow, isn't that something? Or in my case, do I have to have my characters tell the story? because I don't have the language. I, I'm, I probably write way too much to be taken seriously anyway. And John O'Hara had that problem. They said, well, he can't, you know, he's, he, look at all that he writes all the time. And uh, he says, well, what am I supposed to do? I'm a writer. 
I am currently incarcerated <clears throat> in the middle of the Mojave High Desert, dreary and boring. How I ended up here is a long, unbelievable tale involving dysfunctional women, heroin, and pure foolishness. I was driven to write because I enjoyed several of your books so much that I harassed some of my fellow convicts and forced them to give up their usual reading fare in order to read Maximum Bob, Swag, and a couple of others. They are very conservative in their reading habits, and this was not no easy thing. Jacqueline Suzanne is a huge favorite here. <laughs> anyway, your books are the first ones I've liked and could share with my beloved semi-literate fellow criminals and maniacs. <laughs> there are several different theories on how you became so familiar with those who break the social contract, the disconnected, and the outright boneheads who exist on the fringe of society. If it's embarrassing or violates some strange writer's code, please keep your secret to yourself. But if you wouldn't mind terribly, we're all wildly curious from Danbury Correctional. I thought you might be interested in a report on your growing popularity among this prison's hardcore readers. While Harold Robbins, Sidney Sheldon, and Lawrence Sanders remain the most generally popular authors here, more and more of our hardcore are discovering you. Some of, uh, of your recent converts are Charlie, 24, a heroin seller out of, out of 143rd Street, Harlem, Stanley, 35, a heroin, heroin seller out of the Kenilworth Projects in DC, and Mike, 40, a heroin seller and user from Pittsburgh. Your books don't seem to have attracted the cocaine and crack people yet. 